Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope I've got my timing right. I am here uh, in Berlin. My name is Will Fisher, and I am presenting today uh, prototyping in mechanical engineering. So uh, just want to uh, jump right in on that. I'll introduce myself a little bit more in a moment, um, but I just want to kick everything off. Um, sometimes I feel like engineering feels a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy, and uh, so uh, sometimes it just kind of feels like, like this. Here, we'll watch a short video. The original machine had a base plate of pre-famulated amulite surmounted by a malleable logarithmic casing in such a way that the two spurving bearings were in a direct line with a panometric fam. The latter consisted simply of six hydrocoptic marzal veins so fitted to the ambifacient lunar wane shaft that... So if this seems kind of familiar, um, then, uh, then you're in the right place. So um, this is... Uh, an introduction to mechanical engineering, um, and so we'll just jump right in. Uh, to give a bit of my background, I feel like that's really important here. Um, I have a bachelor's and master's degree from Rice University in Houston, Texas. Uh, I did my master's research at NASA. You can see that picture of me right there at Langley Research Center on the left, uh, the bottom left, that's me at age 20 something. Um, and I've been at the uh, mechanical engineering game for a long time. After my work at Rice and NASA, I went on to work at Nano Precision Medical. NPM is a medical device startup still operating. I was the first non-founding employee there. Um, and they have an amazingly cool product, uh, an implant for type 2 diabetes treatment that uses uh, nanoporous titanium, titanium oxide membrane to control the release of drug into the body. So I spent seven and a half years at Nano Precision doing all sorts of cool stuff. So there's the nano pores. Those are actually electron microscope images that I took. Um, and those are, um, they're about 50 nanometers wide at the top and about 600 to 800 nanometers long. Uh, no, I lied, they're uh, 60 microns. Anyway, uh, not that that's super relevant, but you can get this, they've got about a 600 to one aspect ratio there. Um, and so those are, those are the little nanostructures that I worked at while I was at Nano Precision. I also worked there as our head of prototyping. So I supported all of our, um, all of our staff building things in the prototyping department uh, that scientists and engineers on our technical team needed. And they got weird. Uh, radiation shielding, full scale clean rooms, electron microscope mounts, you name it. I built all sorts of ridiculous things on that. While I was at Nano Precision, I sat for the patent registration exam, sometimes called the patent bar, and uh, became a registered United States patent agent. Uh, I thought patents were going to be great fun, but it turns out I prefer my time in the machine shop. We'll get back to that. It's a recurring theme. Um, and so while it's great, uh, it wasn't quite for me. So I kept uh, working at Nano Precision, orchestrated several crane lifts to get major pieces of equipment in, and then figured out how to repair and use those pieces of equipment. Soldering upside down is something of a specialty, but it's a fun one. Um, after that, I started my own company, um, D20 Robotics. Uh, what you see on your screen there is our robot, the Blaster. The Blaster uses facial detection to fire a stream of alcohol into your mouth from across the room. Uh, which is basically the most unnecessary fun engineering project that ever existed. And we had a lot of fun building that. I used that company to go get my MBA at the University of Chicago, uh, which was a fantastic time. But again, I started missing the machine shop. So I moved to Berlin after I graduated uh, where I'm currently located. And uh, I started a company with an old friend of mine building smart furniture. What you see on your screen is a smart bed that lifts itself along a track system and then there's a desk nestled in underneath and it can move from sit to stand to all the way up and that way you have all this extra space if you live in a tiny tiny apartment like mine. So uh, so that's kind of my engineering background. Uh, Wrinkle wound down uh, in August and so I've been freelancing as an engineer since then which means you can hire me. Um, and I also spend some of my free time as an improviser, kind of on a semi-professional level, making jokes at people and, and reacting to things that people tell me to do that's funny. So uh, that's kind of where I, how I got here. Plus, I'm now a certified Hackaday instructor as of uh, four minutes ago. So um, I'm glad you guys are all here. Uh, looking forward to moving through all of this sort of stuff. Because of my background, uh, I am a prototyper. Uh, I am, yes, a mechanical engineer. I've worked in a wide variety of industries. Um, and uh, 
most of that work has been done in the prototyping realm. And so I am not the sort of mechanical engineer that would work for years on uh, you know, a turbine or a jet engine, which are basically the same thing, um, an internal combustion engine, that sort of stuff. Those are really cool things. And I know enough about those things to be dangerous, but my real focus has been in prototyping. And so as a result, the class will be based around kind of the questions you need to ask to get your prototype off the ground. And they tend to be a really nice set of questions, just kind of generally uh, to think about as you're doing mechanical engineering. Cool. Let's dive in. So uh, today's agenda, you guys have kind of already heard my background. Uh, I'll go over a bit of the course overall, what the five weeks will, uh, will study will be about. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about kind of what is prototyping and why we like to prototype. That is kind of an important context, but, but just kind of maybe a little bit of an aside. And then the bulk of today's class will be around schematics and drawings. Um, those represent kind of the fundamentals of communicating mechanical design. And so um, I think uh, that should be really, really useful for you guys. And then it'll kind of set the stage for how we look at stuff as we move forward. So we'll look at uh, some of those. I'll show you some of the drawings that I've made and, uh, and that. So we'll get to that in a little while. Cool. This course, uh, an introduction. So there's a kind of an old joke among uh, mechanical engineers, and I shared that with my office mate who sits behind me, who's very German. He's like, this is an extremely American approach, which is mechanical engineers build the weapons and civil engineers build the targets. And I uh, feel like that's uh, <laughs> maybe a little crass, but, uh, um, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's kind of the running joke among mechanical engineers. So we're, we're here to, to build, the, build the weapons. I'd like to, to expand a little bit, having spent my entire career building non-weapon things. Uh, there's a lot more to mechanical engineering than that. Um, so if we kind of break it down, I consider engineering to be the use of science um, and the scientific method, logic, and empathy to design useful things. Um, and I think you can absolutely use science and logic to design beautiful things, and I think that's art. Um, and I think this, this goal of designing useful things, whether that's useful to an end consumer and kind of a product design standpoint, which I think is uh, kind of the, the more uh, like kind of art focused uh, mechanical design, there's like a, a really nice hybrid there. And a, um, a good product design is mm, the best. Um, or whether your users are like mine have typically been, which is um, kind of more the uh, science and engineering types. So, you know, if you're building tools for another engineer, uh, then you still have to figure out kind of how they are going to use your tools. That's a very important thing. So you need to think whenever you're designing something about how it's going to be used. And we'll talk about that as we talk about design. Kind of That'll be a recurring focus for us. We'll kind of tie that in with everything um, as we go forward. And what makes it mechanical as compared to electrical or chemical or any of those sorts of things? I generally think of mechanical as stuff that moves. Um, and that could be robots and gears. Um, it could be electromechanical things um, like stepper motors, which are kind of at the base of stuff. That's kind of a, an overlap. Um, manufacturing facilities might be an overlap of chemical and mechanical engineers. If you have a plant moving things through turbines and that sort of stuff. Also, stuff in space, which is just cool. Who doesn't love space? Um, also, planes, boats, dirigibles, cars, all of the stuff, the big things that move. Um, also, really small stuff that moves. So, like um, on the nanoscale, um, you know, like I've played around in that world. And there are actuators that can move things, you know, nanometers at a time, which is super cool. Um, and there was definitely a mechanical engineer behind all of that sort of stuff. You also look at manufacturing equipment. Um, oddly enough, Fluids, uh, which refers to both uh, gases and liquids, um, technically, I guess, plasma and potentially other forms of matter, even on the hotter end, are also fluids. Um, but mostly gases and, and liquids are what we're considering here, um, are a branch of mechanical engineering. They do move. They move to fit this, the container that they're in. Um, and thermodynamics, which doesn't always move, is often lumped in with mechanical engineering. We'll talk about that in a little sec. 
Um, and it's that's done because most of the exciting parts of thermo thermodynamics happen to take place in fluids. Uh, thermodynamics in solid objects is a well-established thing, and it's not all that exciting for the most part. Now, of course, some people will argue with me about that, and they're probably right. Um, so um, the things that you would learn if you went to get a mechanical engineering degree, uh, statics, kinetics, and kinematics. Statics is how stuff stays in place. And that's a very relevant thing for mechanical engineers who want things to stay in place. Uh, if you are fastening something to a moving rocket, you want to make sure that it doesn't fail um, in static movement. Uh, kinetics is uh, how stuff would like tumble through the air and that sort of stuff. And kinematics is uh, designed movement, things that rotate about a specific point or um, linkages, things that are going to move gearing, that sort of stuff. And we'll talk about that is going to come in um, a fair bit in uh, in the in the last class in class five. Materials is also commonly taught in conjunction with mechanical engineering. It is a field into unto itself that is magical, um, and I highly recommend many Wikipedia deep dives in there uh, because material science is really really cool. We'll talk about that a lot next week. Week two is focused on basically material science as it pertains to mechanical engineering prototype. <laughs> uh, electromechanical systems, as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, mechatronics, robotics, that stuff often falls into the realm of the mechanical engineer. Fluids, which includes aerodynamics, um, acoustics, turbine design, a lot of that sort of stuff, often taught in mechanical engineering as well. Same with a huge variety of thermodynamics. Um, heat transfer, psychrometrics is the study of uh, dew points and making human habitable uh, environments. It's basically air conditioning, heating, that sort of stuff, and the study of that. Vibration is a huge part of mechanical engineering, um, and that's a very important thing because you don't want your car to vibrate apart. And there's a lot of math in vibration, and that's usually taught towards the end of your degree, along with control theory, which is basically how do you get a robot to stop where you want it to. It's a non-trivial problem, and uh, there are generations of engineers who have worked on this problem, and uh, We've got a pretty good solution, but there's still always more optimal that you can get. Plus, mechanical engineering has a whole, whole, whole lot of math. Much of it is in the calculus world. Oddly enough, until the 1960s and 70s, mechanical engineering was taught entirely with algebra. And uh, you can do basically all of the practical applications of engineering, mechanical engineering, with just algebra. That's true also in a variety of engineering fields, um, using lookup tables and the like. Uh, in the case of mechanical engineering, a lot of times it's Laplace transforms, where you uh, look up a thing in a table, it translates calculus into algebra, you do your algebra, and you translate it back. In the case of electrical engineering, you do the same thing with Fourier transforms, which look at repeated and periodic signals. Um, periodic signals are very uncommon in the mechanical world because of friction, uh, and so the Laplace really looks at the decay of stuff. And that's as far into calculus as we'll get, <laughs> so uh, no need to worry about that uh, any more than that. Just the idea that you could potentially do all of mechanical engineering with no calculus, which is magical. I think that's one of the coolest things that they don't teach you in your mechanical engineering degree. So uh, we probably won't do anything more complicated than basic algebra, maybe some multiplication and stuff. Uh, and most of that will be in uh, weeks four and five. A quick aside, uh, I live and work in Germany. Despite being an American, I speak uh, both of these languages, uh, metric and English. You might think I speak German only poorly, um, but uh, we're going to do most of our work in metric. Now, there are some counterexamples. This very class, we will be looking at schematic drawings in English, and it kills me to do that, but uh, that's the way of the world. Um, I think most, most people coming into mechanical engineering from other fields think to themselves, my god, why would you ever do stuff in the English units? And, uh, and, and this is particularly true in Europe, where uh, there's a lot of criticism I face from my lovely European colleagues uh, about why the English system exists. And if you ever go to a, um, <laughs> an American manufacturing plant, you will see exactly why. And I remember when I first started in... Um, engineering 
in the U.S. I had come right out of undergrad. We had learned both types of units, and I thought to myself, my God, uh, metric is just so much easier. Why don't we use metric? That'll make it way better. Uh, so we made all of our initial drawings in metric um, and uh, you know, stamped them and sent them off to the machine shop, got the parts made, got all of our parts sent back. And I called up the guy and I was like, look, uh, you know, we inspected this part. It's like, you know, like on this dimension. He was like, which dimension? And I was like, this dimension. And he pulls out his print and he looks at it and he's like, oh, you mean the one that's this many foul? And I was like, why did you put this all in inches? What are you doing? And they had gone through our drawings and they had crossed out everything in millimeters and hand calculated them in inches and gone back because all of their machines ran in inches and they had to run everything in inches. So that was kind of a learning experience for me. I very quickly learned to embrace the, the thou, as it's called, which is a thousandth of an inch. Um, the, uh, the English units continued to get crazier, even though science progressed and we were able to do things and, and measure things at incredibly uh, fine details. Uh, you know, most of the scientific world would use nanometers. Uh, of course, the machining world measures things like surface roughness in micro inches, which is a millionth of an inch. Now, that is a preposterous unit for anyone actually like doing something. But you can tell the finish if you move your finger across a 64 micro inch surface as compared to a four micro inch surface, you can tell the difference. Um, and so sometimes you specify these sorts of things. And if you're getting work done in an American machine shop, I regret to inform you they will probably accept English units much more happily than they will metric. Um, and that bums me out because the world should run on metric. And if you let me wave a wand and choose a thing to change about America, that would be down the list of ways, but um, it'd be on there. So I'm going to take a quick swig of water. I'm going pretty quick here. And it's all talking all the time. Um, so just a quick overview of what I am hoping to cover in our five classes. Um, and depending on timing, uh, some things may get cut. So uh, a disclaimer there. The class, class one is an overview of kind of the whole thing, our intro. We'll talk about prototyping. And then the bulk of the class will be on schematic drawings. Class two will be about materials, material selection, uh, material properties, uh, why you would want to choose different materials. Class three is going to be the, the blitz of the classes. We are going to cover uh, not only my 12 recommended tools that a good mechanical engineer would want to have. Most of them are really cheap. You can buy them at the local hardware store. Um, but we'll also take a look at um, fabrication in the machine shop. So a lot of people and a lot of YouTube videos will cover uh, 3D printing. Uh, I want to actually get out into the shop show you what a lathe is. Uh, we probably won't power any of the tools up, show you what a mill is, show you how to think about your parts in different axes and where you'll, where you'll think about design for that. Class four is all of fluids and thermodynamics in an hour, which is <laughs> ambitious because I think I took six courses semester long over the course of those two subjects. So it's gonna be fast, we're gonna be moving. Uh, the, which is exactly the topic of class five, which is motion. We'll talk about uh, gears and gearing, uh, bearings, actuation, motors, uh, and maybe linkages. So there's a ton to cover there. As a result, it's going to be a very high level look at these fields. Um, my goal is to teach you guys a style of thinking so that you can approach your problems and think about where you'd want to look to find the deeper uh, the deeper things. And in fact, this is how I go about solving my problems uh, when I'm prototyping. So just today, I spent hours Googling um, epoxies that will bond to silicone for a project that I'm working on, because that stuff is, is relevant. And sometimes Google is your best friend. It makes us all much better engineers. Um, so that's a very exciting thing. I'll even talk about some of my favorite resources as we kind of go along. So. Um, the pace, as I said, is going to be very, very quick. Um, to learn these skills more in depth, uh, you can certainly ask all of the questions you want in office hours. Or I also recommend I use YouTube frequently to learn stuff uh, that I need to know. If you have um, specific skills, basically, you can YouTube 
how to do a schematic drawing and someone will come up with 15 minutes on how to do this sort of thing or, or how to turn steel on a lathe, all of those sorts of things. Plus, I'll put my email up at the end of the class and you guys can email me directly uh, whenever you like. Um, I don't promise I'll respond if I get a whole lot of things, but usually I do because uh, I'm a compulsive inbox zero or we all have our weird hills to die on. Um, okay, cool. That's the course intro. We'll move right along into what and why is prototyping. Um, so prototyping is, uh, well, I think this quote uh, uh, from Thomas Edison really sums, gets us moving in the right direction, which is one you've heard a bajillion times before. Genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And I think prototyping is kind of the, the, the second percent. You know, The first percent is this inspiration, and then percent number two through maybe 15 is kind of prototyping. Um, and it's important because uh, prototyping is really necessary to teach you something. And uh, you need some way to learn. And I think having kind of like a, a typical prototyping method uh, helps you kind of think through how to get things going. So you start with this inspiration on one hand, um, and you need to get somewhere that kind of proves or disproves your idea. And so that's kind of where prototyping comes in. Um, in order to make it effective, prototyping needs to be quick. Um, and as a result of it being quick, it often is imperfect. And I think that's a real, imperfect may even be a goal in itself uh, in order to get things moving most quickly. And so you really want to prototype towards a specific question, whether you are prototyping a business, which is, can I um, get this startup off the ground? Here we're talking about prototyping stuff, things you're going to make. Um, so you probably want to prototype uh, with a question in mind, such as, uh, what if I'm building a large project will make or break this project? Um, like things moving back and forth on a slide rail, somebody has solved that problem. You don't have to prototype that. Um, but bonding stuff, can I mold this part out of silicone and then glue it to a thing? That's a project that I'm working on right now. Um, and that's a big question. Can I lift a bed and bed frame on spindly legs with little actuators? That was a project for my last startup. And uh, you know you prototype that, and that's a very important thing. Um, and you're looking for the questions that need to be answered before your whole project works. Um, sometimes you're just prototyping the very smallest little widget thing in there um, to make sure that it all works. So as you prototype, your goal is to kind of create a prototype as quickly as possible so that you can still get a solid answer out of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just want that answer. That's the goal of your prototyping. Um, I highly recommend very respectfully and efficiently seeking the advice of experts. Long rambling monologues are obnoxious, but a quick question in and out uh, is a really nice way. And, and oftentimes people who are expert are happy to chat. And sometimes they even get carried away. I will chat at you for longer than you wanted. Um, and so that's, <laughs> that's a thing. <laughs> so if you're respectful about the way you ask and, uh, and that, I think that'll that'll take you the right direction. I think also an important part of prototyping is being ac accepting a failure. Um, the, the value of prototypes is often in the failure. You learn a lot from your mistakes, and I think you should, you should try to prototype in a way that can give you definitive failure or definitive success. Oftentimes, that's impossible, and you end up with some weird shade of gray, and you say, well, this part of it failed, but like I'm going to put this thing in the other way, and like we'll shift things around. I'm finding that in a lot of my, my projects right now, and that's just kind of the nature of prototyping. Uh, failure is really a skill. Uh, you get better at failing. Um, and so I recommend uh, practicing failure. Um, failing quickly is important, knowing when to call it, saying, I've learned everything I can learn from this. Let's move on um, and learn the next thing. Um, and fail usefully so that you answer a question when you fail. And part of that is knowing when to ask the question. And part of that is failing in a way that you can pick yourself back up and do that. I'll let you guys read this while I take a swig of water. I think this is really true. Uh, prototyping is a practiced art. Failure is a practiced art. Uh, all of these things are muscles you work out all the time. Part of the reason it takes me forever to write code 
is that I don't write code very much. I love it, but it takes me forever and then I get frustrated because it takes me forever and then I don't do it. This happens all the time. I'm a lot better at building physical stuff. And then when I want to go build something, I'm like, well, I'll just print it on up in the printer over there or I'll take it out to the shop and fix it. It's all practice. If I practiced, if I coded as a living, I'd be fast at it. I'd probably love it a lot more. Um, also, as you prototype more, I think this is true of anything, you get a better sense for it. Uh, you think to yourself, my gosh, last time uh, I used uh, silicone and it bonded great. I'm going to try that same thing again. Or last time I made this product out of lead using sand casting, uh, maybe I can make it out of aluminum this time. Who knows? Um, I just need to get a hotter forge because lead's melting point is way lower. Class two materials. Okay, so that is the intro. Let's dive into the really fun stuff, which is schematics and drawings. Um, this is one that I put first in part because I knew I had an intro, and this is a slightly smaller subject than the rest, but also because it's a great way to start thinking about mechanical stuff. Um, so I want to start out with a bit of a disclaimer. Drawings and mechanical drawings are entire careers. Um, drafts people are, is the name of this career. You can go to two-year university, two-year college, and get a degree in how to make drawings. It is a, a huge and difficult field, and we are just going to get to the, like, the tiniest little beginning of it um, in a way that is useful to you to be able to read drawings. As a result, we will not cover oh, it's called geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, gd &T, which is um, kind of the gold standard for drawing creation. Um, and you can go and take a two day long seminar from professionals that will teach you to do that. That is how intense a subject that is. That's why we're not covering it. Um, what I wanna be able to do is give you guys the skills so that you can get a drawing out to a machine shop and they can build your part. That's the goal. In half an hour, we're going to try and get you from a place where you say, I've got my part in CAD, uh, which we're not covering CAD at all in this course. You can find that somewhere else. Uh, you can take your part from CAD, put it into the drawing, and get a shop to make the part you want. Ideally, you're going to be, get the part you want, and it's not even going to cost you a fortune because money matters when you're building stuff. I love the schematic. It's one of my very favorites. Um, so drawings are important for communicating stuff. We're gonna go over mechanical drawings. This one is actually a patent drawing um, from a patent, I believe in like maybe the 1950s for a, a butt kicking device, which I think is lovely. Um, pat patent drawings and mechanical drawings have in common uh, their need for, for clear communication of what you're doing. At the, at the core of what a drawing is, is that it is a communication medium. Um, in our case for uh, schematic drawings, we want to specify for manufacturing and for assembly. And it's also important for identification. It identifies you, the designer, as you are related to your part. And it also relates the part to a company, to an assembly, for all of these sorts of things. And it's important that you be able to identify a part uh, if you have a very large assembly. Um, so that's a very important thing. The stakes are pretty high for schematic drawings. This is something you do want to get right. Uh, time and money are very important if you're working as a professional engineer. Your reputation is also on the line if you submit a stupid looking, uh, a stupid looking drawing to a machine shop. Uh, when you submit your next one, they're gonna be like, oh, are you the guy who submitted the, the thing that we couldn't understand? So the goal is uh, communicate clearly. And so your reputation kind of rides on that. Uh, they don't, machinists don't want their time wasted any more than you do. Um, I put death in there with a question mark because I initially had it in there with it struck through. And I showed this to my, my German engineer office mate. And he was like, yeah, but if you design something that people's lives rely on and your drawings are stupid, then you can kill somebody by having your drawings wrong. And I was like, oh my gosh, you're right. Um, so you want to be careful when you're doing these, uh, when you're doing these drawings. Uh, particularly if there is a life, uh, a life changing thing that you're designing, whether it's life saving or life ending, make your drawings good. Uh, here is a schematic that the same German engineer gave me. This is from his, uh, his master's research. Uh, this is an excellent drawing. However, it is baffling. Uh, this is a transmission that he created as part of his thesis. And this is 
uh, as complicated as a drawing as I think I've ever seen. Certainly, I've never built anything this complicated, um, and neither did he. They just made the drawings for the research side of it. But this shows a whole bunch of gears and stuff all interacting, and it is, in a way, I, I consider beautiful mechanical schematics to be mechy porn, uh, mechanical engineers porn, and this is one of those drawings. I just, I just love it. I could stare at this thing all day. I should get this thing in a poster form, put it up on the wall. I love it. Um, so we, this is an assembly drawing. We will be focused on single part drawings for the most part today. Um, so let's talk about how you read a drawing. When you look at a drawing, this is a much, much simpler thing. Uh, I am a huge uh, fan of McMaster Carr. You can see down there on the title block, that's where I got this drawing. This is a simple bevel gear. Uh, it's a two inch diameter. Again, we're back to the English units. I told you it was coming. I'm so sorry to those of you who are not in America. Inches are still stupid. Um, this shows you kind of the fundamental components of that. I think you guys can see my mouse. I hope so. Um, so you can see up here there is a um, representation. This is a view of your part. Um, a top view, a side view, an isometric view. You have uh, dimensions on here. You also have notes, uh, like number of teeth and the tooth pitch. Um, and then you have a title block down here in the bottom right. Every drawing should have all three of those things. So as we move forward, uh, as we look at the views, uh, they typically come in uh, what are called orthographic projections. Uh, there are typically three. Really, since the goal of a drawing is to be communicating stuff, uh, you want to put the views in uh, that are necessary to communicate your drawing. So, so you might not need all of them. In this case, we have a motor from McMaster Car. Um, it's showing you kind of about this size. Um, and it's showing you the three views that are necessary for this particular part. So we've got mounting holes and the layout of those mounting holes on the bottom view. So here they've taken a motor, and it's like they've just rotated it 90 degrees, and then again 90 degrees. So that's the standard way you do it, is you have a front, a top, and a side view. In this case, they've replaced a top view with a bottom view. And, uh, and so you can see where and how these things all match up. And that's relevant. And the reason that these drawing views are chosen as they are is so that you know where the shaft is going to come out the motor relative to the mounting holes, which is basically the most important part of mounting a motor. Um, because if this thing is going to, say, move a, a transmission, you want the shaft to line up and be very concentric with uh, the, the transmission in uh, inlet, the, the um, shaft for, the, for that. And you can get some bearings that'll self-align and that sort of stuff, but for the most part, you know, this will be pretty spot on. And so it's important that their dimensions are accurate uh, for your designs. Now, McMaster is a wonderful resource, whether you're doing stuff in inches or in, in metric. Um, they often offer CAD files for technical parts. So if you need an M3 by eight millimeter countersunk screw, McMaster has the CAD files for all of that stuff, and they let you download them for free. It's magic. Um, so unlike Thingiverse, which is mostly people making uh, models of stuff, and it can be really useful for, um, for things like stepper motors, McMaster has all of your little components um, to put into your CAD file. Um, screws, nuts, washers, uh, motors even. So if you're building a big assembly, um, it can be... Um, it can be helpful to, to have those things there. Um, uh, drawings also typically have, can have detail and section views. So I'll talk about those right now. A detail view is where you have, um, so you can see here, uh, I have my, my part. This is actually a 2.2 meter long threaded rod. Um, and uh, so I actually had this part made and it's, uh, quarter inch in diameter, which is crazy. You're like, Will, why are you mixing inches and meters? Uh, you are absolutely right to hate me right now. So too did this shop, because um, I had this made in an American shop, because it's an American thread standard, but I needed it 2.2 meters long. So they had to convert that to inches. It was a nightmare, but they, they sent it to me. It was magnificent. I would recommend that manufacturer again, for sure. Um, but you can look at the schematic here and see that I've got this. The underline on that 220, 2,200 millimeters uh, means that it is not to scale in this drawing. Um, so I've got this top part. I've taken a detail view here 
So you can see that I've got uh, the A with a circle around it. That indicates the circle, and then the letter indicate the detail. And then I've got my A over here, and this is showing this is an 8 to 1 scale. So this is 8 times larger than my 1 to 1 scale over here. That lets me show um, a thread callout for the thread that I'm using. Here I'm using an M4 thread, which is a standard metric thread. Um, and then I've got a, a thread relief here and that sort of stuff. Um, this was necessary for the components that I was using, um, and it was useful uh, for them to know these things. Uh, then I've also done a section. So what you can see here is where I've got B. As I've got these leaders pointed to the right, it shows basically what would happen if I just took like a very, very sharp knife and cut right down the center of my part on that axis. And then I'm going to fold open and look at just half of that. So that's what section B is here. And it, it is typically noted B dash B because it's going between the point B here and the other point B here. So that shows you how to uh, show a section view. And I'm showing that at scale one to one. Um, and, uh, and then I'm opening up that up and showing an additional detail C here. So I've got my C circle called out at a 10 to one. So this is actually even more zoomed in and my eight to one over here. And that lets me specify the thread that I'm using for this part. So I've done all of these units in uh, millimeters, and I've specified also as a note here that these are trapezoidal thread, that's TR, this trapezoidal thread. A thread fit, that's 7E. So when you specify a thread, there's thread fits. You can look all of this sort of stuff up. And that's all specified in the trapezoidal thread ISO standard 2901. Convenient, you'll hopefully never have to use that, but if you ever do, uh, ISO has you covered for basically every, every mechanical thing that's built, ISO has covered. ISO is an international standards organization. Um, maybe it's the international standards organization. Hmm. Oh, that would be logical. Um, but they have standards for all sorts of stuff. I'll show you a bunch of ISO standards throughout. That's kind of bread and butter for mechanical engineers. Uh, you find yourself coming back to those. There's also um, ANSI, which is American National Standards Institute, and uh, ASME, which is the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, they all produce standards for different things. So if you need standards in English units, those are typically done from the American organizations, ASME and ANSI. If you need metric standards, those are often done by ISO. Um, cool. We're going to come back to this mechanical drawing a bunch of times. Uh, so you'll notice the next thing that's important is tolerances. And we'll talk about tolerances in much greater detail in week three. When you're building something, tolerances really matter. Because if you say something like uh, five plus or minus two, then you have a huge range. But if it's five plus or minus 0 0.0001, your machinist is going to make parts until they hit that spec. And what that means is you are paying for every part they reject because it didn't need spec. So if you over-specify your part, uh, you are going to be paying a lot for it. And sometimes that stuff really, really matters. And you want to specify very, very tight tolerances. Um, but for the most part, you would like to specify the loosest tolerances you can get away with. Um, and so for that, again, ISO has your back covered. 2768 is a magnificent ISO standard. Um, it specifies um, what precisions are needed for mostly for machine parts, um, and so it goes over here. So what you can see is in that previous uh, drawing, I have down here my tolerance, um, and I've zoomed in on that to show you that I've called out ISO 2768MK um, in my title block down here. Um, and that MK shows that I'm looking for a medium designation here. So that says for any dimension what the dimension is, what the tolerance should be for that dimension. And machinists will know this. If you specify ISO 2768, every major machine shop on the planet has heard that and knows to look for what they have to hit. Uh, the K is an additional callout, and the K specifies the um, perpendicularity, parallel, um, flatness, uh, concentricity, those sorts of things. So in my case, because this is a really, really long skinny rod, I wanted to make sure that the top and bottom were concentric so that there's not any bend or bow in this thing. Um, 
So this was um, the threaded rod used for the track system inside of the legs uh, for my bed that was lifting. So I'm hanging a lot of weight off of them. Um, and it's all in tension, so I don't need that thick of a rod. Um, but it's, it can get kind of floppy and bendy. Uh, the guy who's manufacturing them said, as they were coming off the line, these look like spaghetti. And they kind of do. They kind of like flop around. But because I was hanging them, that was fine. But I wanted to make sure that all of the threading lined up with my rods. So I specified that K afterwards. The title blocks are their own thing. That's the third major component of your, of your drawings. Uh, so you have your drawings, like the, the view. Uh, then you have your tolerances. And then your title block is where you specify all of this other stuff. Again, ISO has your back. 7200 uh, is the standard. 2004 is the release date. So ISO standards typically will give you a number identifier and then a release year. So 2004 is the most recent one. And that uh, is nice because it's upgraded to include title blocks created by CAD um, instead of by hand. Whereas the previous one, which I think is 1980, most of the title blocks coming out in 1980 were not done on computers. They were done by hand. Um, so your title block usually will include the part title, the part number, uh, the tolerance call out, like I showed you just a second ago, the units. Um, this is particularly relevant if you want to send metric units to an American shop or uh, inch units to anywhere else. Um, I would, I would definitely specify that um, because you can end up with the, uh, the classic um, miscommunication like in, uh, what is it, this is Spinal Tap, where they end up with a tiny stone hinge because they use the wrong units instead of a massive and impressive stone hinge. This happens. Um, or in worst case, uh, the Mars Climate Orbiter, which scrapped a zillion dollar mission uh, into the surface of Mars because the international team was using meters and the uh, American team was using feet. Oops. Uh, also, absolutely necessary to specify material. That typically lives in the, uh, in the title block. So you can see here, I've specified C15 steel. That's a type of steel or equivalent. So sometimes a machine shop will have a better quality material on hand. And rather than ordering new, or they have scrap of a material that you'd rather have anyway. So I like to specify or equivalent because that lets the machine shop choose. That's true in most cases. Some cases you need a specific material. So we were doing uh, titanium nanostructures and we were getting the parts pre-machined and there we needed a high purity titanium. So you couldn't just say commercially pure titanium or equivalent because they would alloy it with cheaper things to make it more machinable because it's cheaper for the machine shop. So then you specify, you know, CP grade four titanium and that's what you get. And then you say, you know, we need material specs and all that sort of stuff. But for the most part, I would take my material spec and toss an ore equivalent in there. How are we doing on time? Ooh, we gotta be moving. Um, oftentimes you also specify paper size and scale. In the modern era, mostly you're sending drawings around by PDF. So paper size is kind of weird, but a machine shop will often print out uh, prints and then they will compare the part to the print. So they will print out your drawing. When they make the part, they will set your part, the part on top of the drawing and compare it on all the things to make sure that they didn't mess it up kind of on the course uh, dimensions, right? So like they didn't get the L direction backwards or something. Um, you always put your name on it. You, as a designer, uh, you should be proud of the thing you're doing. Um, but also it's important that they know who to ask questions of. Um, sometimes you'll see multiple names in a drawing, like drawn by, uh, designed by, drawn by, approved by. And that's really important if you work for a company, having someone approve your drawings just means that somebody has, someone else has gone through and made sure that everything makes sense. They've run the numbers, um, particularly in, in industries like aerospace um, or um, big manufacturing industries. There are a lot of checks on this sort of thing to make sure that you aren't producing parts that could hurt people. Uh, if you're just a hobbyist, you're probably not approving any drawings. You don't need it. Um, Oftentimes, if you're working for a company or an organization, you put that in the title block. You can see here, I've downloaded the uh, thing from Wiki Wikipedia, and Wikimedia Commons has put their organization title in here. Uh, there's also often approval information and the appropriate dates approved on that sort of stuff. That's important for the reasons I just said. Uh, include as necessary if you have multiple sheets, sheet numbers, notes. Uh, that can be, hey, anodize this thing after you make it. 
um, all your signatures. Confidentiality agreements on these. If you have an NDA in place with someone, you have patent, patent or patent pending stuff, and you want to keep trade secret, put your confidentiality notice on every single sheet. Always do that. The patent uh, agent in me says, put your confidentiality notice on your, in your title block and have an NDA in place, have them sign it. And then they know that it's confidential and privileged information. And if they share it, then all the legal stuff happens to them that's bad. That's a lecture that's not included in mechanical engineering. OK, cool. Let's take a look at a drawing. I'm going to pull up Fusion here. So this is a drawing for a part. I'll show you the part that I've got here. So this is one that I just threw together for the purposes of a drawing. I've got that little square piece over there. I've got, uh, I've got my rotational things here. I've got a nice little hole in the bottom. This is not a part used for anything. It's just one made so that we could draw a thing. So we'll head over here to our drawing. This is a drawing I made for it. And I want to show you a couple of things here that I've kind of already referenced. First of all, I've got my primary view here in the upper left. That's fairly common when you're drawing stuff. Most machinists will, will tend to look in the, uh, in the top left part of your drawing um, for uh, the, the main thing. Because I'm using CAD, I like to have an isometric view down here on the bottom right. I usually just put that wherever I can, wherever it's convenient, and I have space left over. The reason I do that uh, is just so the machinist can say, oh, this is what it's supposed to look like. I get it. Because this part, as it's drawn without that, can be a little bit difficult to determine. I've also specified in here a center line. For uh, parts that are circular, it is common to put a center line in, though not mandatory. And that indicates to the machinist that you want all of these dimensions to be concentric. And if you're producing something like a pin that has to fit in a thing that has to fit into another thing, uh, which we'll, I'll show you in a sec why that might be relevant, then having that center line says the machinist, uh, concentricity matters. Um, concentricity is the measure of how concentric two circles are with each other, just to specify that. And that can be relevant if you have bearings, if you have a shaft, anything that's going to be rotating particularly at high speeds. Uh, this is super important. Um, and so, um, yeah, so uh, then you've got uh, this top view. So what I've done there is I'm now just looking at the top of it. I'm tilting it over and taking a look at it in the top. And that shows that this is a square. Because if I look at just this side view, I cannot determine that's a square. That could also be a circle or a hex. It could be any number of shapes um, arbitrarily defined but I want my machinist to know that this thing is square on top. Now, if I just show that that's square, that's one thing. But you'll notice that I have two identical callouts here. Now, if I'm doing this in CAD, I set those equal to each other. Um, but here on my drawing, I want to specify those independently so that the machinist knows just how big that square is. So. Um, I'm also going to show a section view here, so I can zoom in a little bit. Um, so what I've done, you can see that I've got that same A to A callout, and I'm showing that my scale here is 2 to 1. Um, and that's where I'm really putting most of my dimensions on. So the square I need to dimension from the top view because it's the only place that it's really visible. Here I'm showing uh, almost all of my dimensions, um, except the things that I know that I'm going to call out later in my detail B here. So I have my 11 in parentheses, because that is actually specified over here. 7 plus 4 is 11. So where I have a dimension that's specified somewhere else, I put it in parentheses. And that tells the machinist, like, hey, this is a dimension that like, you can use, but I'm going to inspect my part to a different dimension. This is just an implicit dimension rather than explicit. Um, I'm also taking a look at some other things here. I have my diameter callout here at 5 millimeters. I have this piece here, so you can see those leaders go to this like inner, inner part right here, that, that bevel cut that I've got. The inner diameter there is 20, 20 millimeters. Um, my whole depth here is 15. And just so that you guys can see it, I have what's called a, um, uh, a symmetric uh, tolerance here. And this is, I want that hole to be a very specific depth. Let's say I have a pin that has to fit perfectly in there. Um, I want that whole depth to be more precise than my, my standard drawing template has. So this is over defining that. And I can do that on key dimensions that I really need my machine shop to hit precisely. Um, so I've done that here. 
Um, the other dimensions are all just in millimeters. I have one other thing to show on that part, which is here I've done what's called a, um, a bilateral tolerance. So let's say I want this thing to be 40, which is what I have in my CAD, but I don't mind if it's bigger, but I mind if it's smaller. Maybe it has to seal on the inside of something, and I really need this to be a thing. So I can specify that it's not to be any bigger than 40.22 and not any smaller than 39.995. So I have a very, very tight tolerance on the bottom and a relatively generous one on the top. And you can specify that because that's, that's what I want. So then I'm going over, here, whoop, going over here and looking on the detail just to kind of finish this out, um, showing my heights. Um, and the reason that I'm showing my height like this is because I'm going to inspect these dimensions later. Um, a mechanical schematic is a schematic drawing is a contract that you have with a machine shop. And so every dimension that you specify, you should be able to inspect somehow. And we'll talk about that a little bit later in inspection. But because, you, because this is a contract, if you get a part back you don't want, you should be able to inspect and say to your, um, to your shop, hey, um, this part didn't meet the drawing. I'm rejecting it and not paying for it because it's out of spec. And they should, a good shop will say, gosh, we'll take those parts back. Either they toss them or they remachine them to make to fit spec. Um, you know, if you're machining out of a very expensive material, they might remachine um, to, to make it hit spec. You know, you can get gold machined. So, yeesh, why? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so this is our, our demo one. We'll head back over to the slideshow. Um, normally, I, this is where I would ask in a class any questions, but since I can't hear you, no questions for you till office hours. <laughs> take them down, take notes. Um, so we'll think a little bit more about how each of these parts are made in class three. But when you create a drawing, you're really going to want to create a drawing from, um, from, uh, the, uh, from the point of view of how will this be created. Um, also, because it is communication, you want to be uh, clear um, on the visuals. Uh, you want to make sure that you don't have a bunch of tolerances interfering with each other and that sort of stuff. Oh, I see uh, chat is blowing up. Sorry. Um, okay. I, I will address questions at the end. Um, so uh, you want to make sure you don't overlap uh, tolerances. Um, so that they're difficult to see. Remember that you're going to be inspecting with these parts. Um, so we'll talk about inspection in a little while, but you're gonna to wanna to be uh, inspecting to your drawings and that's important. Um, and so think about dimensioning the things that you're actually going to inspect. Um, and don't over-specify. If you specify very, very tight tolerances, the machine shop will charge you extra to do that. And so, uh, like I said before, if you specify plus or minus 0. 0.00000, Five, the machine shop is going to uh, the machine shop is going to reject parts until they get ones that fit, and so they're charging you for all the stuff that they reject too because their time is worth it. Uh, don't over communicate. This is important. Like, let's say you have valuable intellectual property, you are going to assemble three things yourself, but you want different shops to handle them all so nobody figures your stuff out. You can send different drawings to different people, and no assembly drawing to one individual. That way, you keep all of your parts trade secret, and no one shop has the, the, the knowledge to recreate your whole invention. Um, and this, is, this can be done, um, sometimes you, you are more comfortable uh, with one machine shop or another for IP reasons or, or for whatever reasons, or with mass manufacturers. Um, um, so that's, uh, that's an, important, an important thing. Um, we'll talk about tolerance stackups in the next slide. That's something that you want to av avoid um, if possible. And I'll talk with that. And I also think it's oftentimes good when you're making your um, uh, your drawing to check in with your machinist or your manufacturer because they're the ones making this stuff. They will have very good advice on how to make your drawings. Cool. Let's talk about tolerance stackups, which is the last thing in drawings. Then we're going to talk about inspection. And I got to cram all that into six minutes. So off we go. Um, tolerance stackups are what happens. Uh, here. So I will show you. Here's the part. I have two parts that have to fit together. I have a pin and a little flange. Um, again, I drew these, I made these just for this class so you can kind of see what they look like. They fit together. And I've just got a through hole there. So when we look at this in our assembly view, I'm showing these sorts of things. Here's what an assembly would look like. You can see I've got my section view. This is how they fit together. 
just to get you a little familiar. I thought I was going to be moving faster and have more time to talk about assembly views, but nope, on we go. Um, okay, so I've got my pin. I'm going to skip to my pin here. Now, my pin has a 28 millimeter uh, length to it. Now, this is according to ISO 2768MK, which um, we can look at over here. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Uh, I don't have it. Well, oops, because um, I had it in my slides. Uh, but anyway, that should be a plus or minus uh, 0.5, I think, at 28 millimeters. And then I've got my 7.4, which should be plus or minus 0.1. So some of you may already have anticipated where I'm going with this. So I've got my part over here. Oops, it's got some rendering issues. Got it. Um, and here, what I've done is I've specified this whole thing. So let's say I want this pin to drop in and just barely touch the bottom of the flange. All of this adds up to 28. But if each of these things is plus 0.5 or plus 0.1, if they're all at minimum, then my pin is far too long. And if they're all at maximum and my pin is at minimum, then it's far too short. And so I end up with this, with this lack, and that's what tolerance stack up is. So the fact that I've specified these, whole, these things all back to back to back to back to back means the machinist can make this thing, oops, um, can make this one 7.6, and this one 5.1, and this one 10.1, and this one 0.6, and this one 5.1. Now my whole thing, which has five dimensions in there, is um, a full, uh, what, two millimeters long? from what it should be, or uh, 0.5 millimeters. So I've, I've completely obliterated that nice tolerance that I had on my other thing. So that's kind of the fundamental of tolerance stack up. And you find this in places where you have back to back to back to back tolerances. You want to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is by specking a top to bottom dimension to cover your whole thing. Or you can have those limit specifications in there. But when you're making your drawings, if you have a critical dimension like this, you definitely want to specify that. Similarly. I have a 7.5 call out here. I've got my 7.4 over here, but it's 7.4 plus or minus 0.1. This one is 7.5 plus or minus 1. So if this comes out at 7.4 and my other comes out at 7.5, they're both still in spec, but my parts don't fit together. Now I've got problems. So that's why you would want to use tighter tolerancing or specs. And, and you, can, you can specify the nominal dimension, this 7.5, then you could say, you know, plus 0.2 minus zero. And that is an important thing. And in your CAD program, if I double click on this, if I double click on this, double, double click on this, oh, it's over here underneath my video thing. I can't see it. Um, it'll show me a tolerance type and I can specify symmetric deviation and limit. And that's a nice way to do that. So this is Fusion, but SolidWorks will do the same thing. So we'll pro -E. all of these drawing programs will let you do that. Cool, that's tolerance stack ups. How am I doing on time? Eep, we gotta move quick. Okay, so inspection, you always, when you order a part from a manufacturer, uh, want to inspect um, with that, um, with your parts coming in. You should inspect assemblies so that they fit together. And that way, if you have multiple parts coming from the same manufacturer, you can say, look, they don't fit. Oftentimes a manufacturer will check them before they go out the door because manufacturers tend to have um, tend to have their, uh, their own QA, and they will inspect their parts. Um, check threads with known fasteners. You could take an M4 bolt, and you could put an M4 nut on it. Um, you could do the same thing with your parts if you specify a thread. Uh, measure your stuff. I recommend calipers. I'm going to show you how to use those super duper fast in a second. You can also buy pin gauges. These are very precise, basically very precise little pieces that you can stick into things to measure internal dimensions, which is harder to do uh, with uh, calipers. If you need something to be extremely flat, oftentimes people will inspect on a granite flat, which is a big piece of very flat granite, and you can slide your piece across it to make sure things are parallel and that sort of stuff. Optical inspection is fraught. Um, because if you're just looking at a thing, your eyeballs are not that accurate. Uh, if it's off to the eye, then you, then you should definitely reject it. Um, but it's hard to in inspect things optically. There is an entire field of optical inspection apparatuses, um, and you can buy, you could spend millions of dollars on inspection tools and then inspect things very precisely and automatically and all that sort of stuff. But you as a hobbyist don't care about that. I would tend to avoid optical inspection except where it's absolutely necessary. Cool. Final thing, let's talk calipers. I'm going to shift you over uh, to a thing. Uh, nope, you know what? I'm just going to do it here.
Um, okay, so this is a pair of calipers, as you can see here. Um, you can buy these on Amazon for, for you know, 15 bucks. Um, you can spend 200 on a really nice pair. Uh, honestly, most people, a $15 pair will do. So what happens is I scroll this open, my dimensions go up and down. Um, and so like a normal thing, I can measure. So I've got a paintbrush right here. I can measure my diameter by sticking it in there, rolling back till it's firm, and then I can see that my paintbrush diameter, oops, I got on the wrong part, is 3.79. I'm reading this backwards in the video of myself, so this is a real adventure. If I'm looking to measure the internal diameter of something, uh, so I've got this spool of uh, solder, I can use the back end here and open it up until there, and now I know that the inside diameter is about 21 uh, millimeters here. Um, the final one that I might want to do is the called, what's called the depth gauge. And this is kind of the hidden power of a pair of calipers. So here I have my calipers. There's a piece that comes out the bottom end here. You can see it. It scrolls out the bottom. So I can use that. I can put that inside a hole and scroll down um, until I hit the bottom of something. So in this case, a through hole, I'm hitting the, the thing. So I'm going in there until I hit. And now I know the depth, the, the total depth of my hole. So if I have a blind hole, I can measure my blind hole that way. So that's a pretty cool method um, to use calipers. Cool. I think we're basically at our hour. Yep, I'm a minute over. So conveniently, I got just about an hour of stuff. We're through everything. Just want to leave you with one final thought. Engineering kind of at its core is about humility. You're going to work with a lot of people, um, machinists, um, builders, things, people who are building stuff. Uh, never underestimate those people. They are magnificent, and you will learn a lot. Uh, you will learn a lot from them in that. So, uh, yeah, be just be kind to the people that you're working with. It's important.